It's alive. It's alive. It's alive. It's alive. Hello and welcome to a live after reading. I'm Tim Niederreiter, and with me today is a returning guest, a champion of this show, Tosca Lee. Welcome back. Thank you so much for having me back again. It's great to have you back. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, tell readers what you've been up to. Well, I, must not, I, I must not have misbehaved too badly if you had me back. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think last we spoke, the line between had just come out, and. I have just released the sequel, A Single Light, um, just a few days ago. So um, it's just a duology, two books. So there's no more after this um, in that grouping. And A Single Light uh, picks up right where the line between leaves off. Uh, you want me to recap kind of the story? of? Yeah, please do. Yeah, okay. So the line between is the story of uh, a young woman named Winter Roth. And at the beginning of the story... She is getting ousted from a, a doomsday cult on the American prairie in Iowa. One state over. I live in Nebraska, so I put the crazy <laughs> people in Iowa. Sorry, Iowa. Um, so she is getting ousted, and she is now forced to start over in an outside secular world that she's come to that she's been taught to regard as evil. And so as she's doing that, a disease uh, that emerged from the melting permafrost has begun to spread. Uh, throughout the Pacific uh, Northwest, uh, came, came down from Alaska. And um, as winter is starting her new life over, it becomes a pandemic and spreads across the United States. There is uh, an opportunistic attack, cyber attack on the electrical grid, which goes down. And uh, through a series of events, winter comes into possession of a set of medical samples that she believes may have something to do with the disease. And she now has to get them to a very specific person, two States over in the middle of a crisis and a pandemic with fuel running low and no electricity and all this stuff. So that is the line between, um, of course, that's just the setup. So I didn't give anything away, um, <laughs> but a single light picks up right where we left off with the first book, um, winter and her, New friend Chase are um, holed up in a bunker. They believe they're safe. They believe they're waiting out the disease and that when they emerge in six months, things should be much better. But of course, nothing ever goes as planned. And so I took the action and I I took the, the drama and the situation and I made it uh, many times more dire and I cranked up the action uh, quite a few times as well. So it was a super fun book to write. And I'm really, really excited to report that readers are responding very favorably to it. So I'm just really, really happy with, with um, the fact that they're enjoying it. Uh, yeah, that's great. I, I, I noticed at one point how the line between was just, I think maybe this was before the previous episode, but how the line between just amazing reviews on that book uh, oh. early on, especially. And I imagine that uh, this one probably isn't going to disappoint either. You know? I've been really kind of blown away to be honest. So <laughs> it's like, wow, I, I'm just really, really happy that fans of the first book are not feeling disappointed because, you know, sometimes you feel a little disappointed with the, you know, a follow-up installment. And I really try very, very hard um, to make sure that I give them hopefully more than they expected. Have you not written many sequels then? I've written, let's see, I wrote a sequel to The Progeny mm -hmm. and that was called Firstborn. And then oh. I did a trilogy with Ted Decker. And so that was three books. So I've I guess I've written, you know, a few. Okay, but yeah, yeah. So, but, but most of your books are sequels. You're not like a Stephen King kind of approach. Well, I do. I would say this is my eleventh book, so most oh, of my okay. books so, are no. standalone. Yeah, <laughs> okay, that makes sense. So, though. yep, yep. That's kind of what I was trying to get at. I should have been more more clear. No, that's uh, all right. Yeah, most of mine are standalones. So I've I've had the one one trilogy and two duologies. Okay. Yeah. Pretty short series. I mean, at least by the standards of someone who's like, like me, I'm publishing independently. I'm like, yeah, they're saying five books is a series now. I was like, mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, I'm just gonna, it's going to take a long time guys. <laughs> yeah. And you know, I, 
I have different reasons for wanting to kind of keep it short. You know, um, one of them is, you know, you just, I feel like I don't know how it's going to, to do and how it's going to play out. So I'd rather, you know, commit to two and kind of see, um, historically when you publish a series, you know, it, you have to continue to engage that audience mm-hmm. over and over and over. But even as you do sales for a subsequent books can drop off. And I've seen that happen with my own trilogies before. Um, so part of why I keep them short and write so many standalones is I just kind of like to keep it fresh. But that said, that does make it a lot more time consuming. No, absolutely. I just think it, uh, yeah. So you, you, you're not, do- and you're not one of those writers, I assume who writes, with like all your books in one universe kind of thing. I mean, it sounds like the yeah. line between and a single yeah. light would be kind of hard to keep putting this in a universe. <laughs> yeah. Progeny. No, they're the progeny and firstborn are their own thing. Mm-hmm. So those two are on their own. And then these two are on their own. And then my standalones are, are uh, mostly historicals. So they are just dotted throughout history. So nice. Nice. Yeah. I, I, I think, uh, I think I have a really hard time personally as well. Writing sequels have gotten a little better at it recently, but mm. it's such a, it's such a different animal than writing the first book of a series. Yeah, it is. Um, but I, I kind of like that because, you know, you kind of know what you're dealing with. It's a known quantity. You're familiar with the characters in the world. So I like that part of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. I, uh, the familiarity is useful. I, I guess I haven't written a whole lot of actual sequels. I mean, mm-hmm. most of my series are books that were originally one book and it just got huge. Mm-hmm. And yeah. then there were not natural break points within that giant book. <laughs> oh, gotcha. Yep. So I didn't write them as sequels per se. I wrote them as one book that broke into several books and that was edited down. Mm. Um, but I've got to say, so this book is, you know, it's, a, it's another uh, near future thriller type approach, right? Uh, yep. So I would call the line between, well, our, our TV showrunner, these these books are in development for TV. Ooh, so our, our TV showrunner has, has called the line between co-apocalyptic because the apocalypse <laughs> hasn't happened yet. So it's happening as the storyline is, is playing out. So... Um, I, I like that term. Um, mm, I will yeah. give him credit, Glenn Whitman. He's our showrunner. So he coined it, but I'm using it. Co-apocalyptic. And then by the time the second book picks up, even though it does come in right after the first one ends, I would I would consider it more dystopian leaning. So things- closer to a post-apocalyptic than yeah. a co-apocalyptic. Yeah, because yeah, the apocalypse is happening really, really fast. So Okay. Well, that's... That's interesting. So, uh, do you have you written much? I guess, I guess you haven't written much post-apocalyptic fiction yet, or at least you haven't. Well, released. there's um, my trilogy with Ted Decker okay. was a dystopian. Showing my ignorance here. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. My trilogy with Ted Decker is dystopian. So that one happened 500 years in the future after, um, you know, okay. something that might have been like a, a World War Three situation. Okay, so okay. so definitely some post-apocalyptic in the in the old uh, backlog there too. Oh yeah, yeah, love it's it. Nice. nice. I, I've, well, I mean, I mean, a couple of these anthologies I was working on over, the, you know, working on stories for over the summer, mm-hmm. and the third one that hasn't come out yet. I, I, I it's been announced, but it hasn't. It's not. It doesn't come out till October. Is, uh, is post apocalyptic, and that one was kind of funny because that was the one that I thought like, oh, that's a genre that's got the least restrictions. But mm-hmm. then I was kind of stuffed. I was like, now what do I do? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's like, what can I do? Uh, and I ended up writing a story about, because I, I've, I've been going more of a fantasy direction with my work. Mm-hmm. So I ended up writing a story about, you know, a, a, a world that flooded and there were evil mermaids. Evil mermaids. From another dimension. <laughs> I love it. Earth to live on it. So there's like no land left and people are on boats. Anyway. I love it. Uh, it's like yeah. water world kind of. Yeah, a little bit. Oh, there's still some land, I guess I should say. There's like islands and just tons of boats. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it was, uh, anyway, that, that's just, that's just something that was on my mind. And obviously I'm wandering a little bit, but when, when you write post-apocalyptic in particular, Mm -hmm. do you, I mean, you've got, you've approached it from some different flavors, obviously from the co-apocalyptic, you know, very near to the time of the apocalypse event Mm -hmm. to the much further future. Is there a big difference between those two as far as how you approach that? Well, yeah, I mean, um, the co-apocalyptic one, I mean, the the thing, the key to that is it's got to be so familiar and so 
mm-hmm. so close to life as we normal, you know, the status quo of life as we know it today that, um, you know, that just one or two things kind of swerve off path. And, and I, I think that's, that's, you know, you want the, you want it to be very realistic and very recognizable as, you know, this is how it is. And then one or two things go wrong. And, um, you know, for my readers, that's, that's the thing they enjoyed about these books that, that, you know, that they say over and over, this is really scary because it seems like it could happen. Um, but that's because you said it in, in a time that is so close to, to life as we know it now for the, the, you know, post-apocalyptic stuff, you know, that in a way it's like writing fantasy because yeah. you're world building. So, um, it might be considered more along the lines of sci-fi because it's futuristic, but, it's the same in that it's very speculative in nature and you've got to redesign the world basically. Yeah. And some of the longest running, some of the largest and longest running fantasy series, like the wheel of time, Mm -hmm. that's actually Mm post-apocalyptic fantasy. Mm -hmm. I mean, it takes place way, way in the future when no one even remembers our time. So it's very, but apparently it's, that's the official, uh, I've been paying some attention to some wheel of time stuff recently. Mm-hmm. I'm not a huge fan of that series. So I shouldn't have said that on the air probably. Oh, well, <laughs> oh, people no. can, people can hate, you know, they can hate me. But Our that's... production team is the same one that uh, is working on wheel of time with Amazon. Well, there's, uh, I, I'm sure they'll do a good job. I just yeah, like, you know, I, <laughs> I, I just don't know about uh, the, the books. They were my favorite thing in the world. Well, you know, um, and not every book is for yeah. every person. So I think that's okay. You yeah, know? it's fine. I just, I just know there's a ton of fans out there and I, I, and I am a fantasy author too, so it's like, oh, I'm going to talk shit about the wheel of time now. <laughs> okay, great idea. Um, no, I mean, I, I, anyway, I think I the main my main and this is kind of a story. I, I don't think I've told it on the podcast, but one one of my and this is just a random element, but one of the main reasons I didn't get much further into wheel of time, I got to book three, and the copy of book three I had, the pages were literally falling out of it. I'm like, I guess I'm not getting much further. Mm. So I, I couldn't get through that book. That was a long time ago. Mm. Didn't I was like, I'm not getting another copy of this. Uh, it wasn't engaged enough at the time. No. So uh, as a teenager, was it so, a new book or no, an old no, it was, book? It, well, it's one of my brothers had already read it like a couple. Oh, times. gotcha. Okay. Oh, uh, it was, it was a fine book, but it was a little mass market paperback that was 800 pages long. So it yeah. just took too much. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, the, that's just the limitations of the paper books, you know. Long live the new okay. digital. Um, I mean, I, I like, like paper books. Paper. Too, yeah. I, yeah, I enjoy them both. Uh, for a huge book, like a huge fantasy book, like those ones, they are classically released in giant, you know, giant right. formats. Like the, the Brandon Sanderson stuff that I really like. A lot of that stuff's in these giant tomes, but they're much more practical in ebook. <laughs> Yeah, that's you can true. Actually carry that around. Well, you know, Brandon finished the Wheel of Time uh, series. Oh, I, after, yeah, I know this. yeah, yeah. Uh, he actually yeah. he went to my high school. Oh wow! Wow, that's several connection. years after me. I'm older than him. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I met him. I met him at one of the writing excuses retreats once. Oh, cool. Uh, the first one actually, and he. It was funny because I, I remember my exchange was very simple because I, I didn't talk to him much. He's a very busy guy. Even when he's on a retreat, he's mm-hmm. like, I'm buckled down to write because I only do 500 words an hour is what he told us. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I thought, I like, wow, you're way taller than you look in your photos because I've never, I'd never seen a photo of his, you know, how of his like body, just his face. And I thought, like, well, mm-hmm. that guy looks like he's a little guy. I don't know oh. why. I don't know why I just assumed. But he's as big as I am. And I'm like 6'3". Wow. So, so we're both giants. Um, wow. I had no idea. I've never yeah. met him. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, he basically picture a hobbit, but very tall. <laughs> um, he's a nice guy. Um, anyway, and a great writer. So enough about that, though. That's that's just my digression into fantasy because I've been thinking a lot about it. That's my current work in progress is fantasy. So uh, as far as the, the single light. This book, you said it, you were actually about the combat, like the action stuff in it, and maybe not combat. You said action. Does mm-hmm. that mean that there's that there is that more on the suspense side, or is there really like violence to a large degree in this book compared to the previous? Um, I would say the violence is probably about the same, oh. maybe slightly more, but um, it's it's not like a, I didn't ratchet that part up so much. Okay. I think the 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 speed of the pacing. I, I feel like was much faster. Okay. And part of that's due in part 
um, just to the structure because the first book, um, about half of it, the first half goes back and forth between the present and the past. So um, there's two storylines that are interwoven together from two different time periods around the same character. So um, the sequel doesn't have that. The sequel is just the present moment survival now. And so mm. by virtue of that alone, I'd say the pacing is much quicker. Okay. Yeah. I imagine that's, so, so that, that's kind of a shift. I'm always kind of, I'd be kind of wary of doing that, but it obviously pays off for a lot of people that kind of departure, or would you mm-hmm. say it's much as that big of a, as big of a departure as I'm feeling like it? Well, saying. it's, it's a different format than the beginning, but the second half of the first book was just straight like here and now. So okay. basically, it's just a continuation of of the latter part of the first book. Basically, okay. So the first yeah. book starts kind of slow, then it tra- starts and ramps up, and then well, yeah, it just well, starts it goes back and up. forth. So okay. Okay. yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's interesting. I I like thinking about the the tempo. You know, that kind of yeah pace of the novel is kind of an interesting subject, but it's hard for me to talk about right now because I just. I don't know. I, I should if I I, sh- I should have done my due diligence and read the line between I, <laughs> by now. But oh, you should read it. It's I, I have a copy biased. of it. I have a copy <laughs> of my Kindle, and I'm like, I just need to get to that. I might be biased. I think it's a good one. But <laughs> I say that I I I actually say that um, with a little more object objectivity than than I would normally have, just because I when I wrote it, the first draft was not good, mm-hmm. and I ended up rewriting it two or three more times. So uh, before I even started the editing process, which is four edits, uh, when you oh. are traditionally published, you've got your substantive edit, then your line edit, then your copy edit, and then you go through the galley proof. And we went through the galleys actually two or three times because there were some uh, different things that went wrong there. So um, I probably made 10 passes through that book all told, but the first few were were absolute rewrites. So. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So it took a very long time for me to get to the point where I can now say that I feel like it's a good book. I would not have been able to say that with any kind of certainty, you know, halfway through the process. Even when it came out, I was, I was, uh, well, I was writing the sequel, A Single mm-hmm. Life. When the, the first one started to come out, the early review copies uh, appeared on NetGalley, which is where, you know, bloggers and reviewers go to get early copies and uh, preview the book and write their reviews up so that they appear when the book comes out. And I, through a series of events, I realized that it was up on NetGalley four months, you know, before it released. And here I am writing the sequel. My confidence is not good. I wasn't sure, you know, if I had ever, you know, if I had done enough to bring it up to par. And I told myself not to go look at it on NetGalley because I couldn't, my confidence was finally coming back and I couldn't afford to lose it again. And, um, but of course, you know, it's there, so I couldn't help it. I had to go see what people were saying and I was just blown away by the comments and just really very, very grateful that they were good. So, but it took a lot of work that one did. Oh yeah. So you must, you must've worked on the the, uh, single light must've been a lot smoother of a process then. Oh yeah. And you know, what happened is, and I always say, you, you need to know yourself. You need to know how you work best. And that goes for writing or anything. And mm-hmm. what happened is I basically violated my own kind of knowledge of myself. I, I know that I need a certain amount of outline to proceed. Mm-hmm. And I winged it way more than I should have. And it cost me in the end. So by the time I started the second one, um, it was like, okay, no, no. I I brought back in my editor friend that has, you know, edited so many of my books before I even turned them in. And I was like, okay, help me figure out, you know, what I did wrong before and how I'm going to not do that again. And it went very quickly. It was much more fun. It was much smoother. Um, so, yeah. Oh, that's, that's great. Live and learn, right? You know, yeah, well, I, yeah you'd think I would have known better, but. Well, yeah, you know, you'd think after 10 books, people... to be a maverick, but you know, <laughs> well, you know, I mean, you'd think after 10 books, the writer or writers would have things down more, but you know, yeah. Yeah, since the feel of every book is quite different. So it makes sense that a lot of writers, you know, I know I wrote, I've written maybe 20, 30 books now and okay. none of them, and they're all very different and, or they all felt very different when I was writing them. Yeah. I've got to say though, I mean, when I talked to my twin brother about it, it's kind of similar to what you were saying. It's like, well, you know. This happened exactly the same way last time. Maybe you should do something about it. Right. Kind of his point of view. 
Well, you know, in most books, I mean, I, I, I tend to follow a, a pretty classic three act structure because it works. And so I was thinking, you know, I know the structure. I'm, I know that like at this point, something needs to happen at this point, you know, and I was like, if I just stick to the structure, I think I, I'm okay, but no, I need structure and I need to prepare my outline better of the various plot points ahead of time. So now I know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, do you, so is your outline uh, complicated or, I mean, not complex. Is How deep do you go in your outline? Do you go down to the scene level? Maybe no. we've talked about this before. Okay. No, no, I, I don't because I feel like for me, um, you know, when I leave one scene and I prepare to set up the next one, I, I need to have that wiggle room to kind of create in the moment. So in that way, I leave that open. But as far as like, you know, kind of what's going to happen and, when does that first, you know, call to action, you know, in the first, what, 9% or 10% of the book, what's going to happen there? I, I have to figure all those turning points out or I'm just, I'm, I'm screwed. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. I, I, I do kind of outline still. I, I was been doing a lot for this book. I've been outlining a lot for this new book because it's going to be a beefy volume of mm. epic fantasy. But uh, it was kind of funny. I mean, I was actually because uh, I was one of my one of my other writer friends uh, who's in my writing group asked me, he's like, you know, can I see one of your outlines? Because we, we are both dictating now. We both dictate yep. our fiction now. Oh, and wow. he's like, can I see what you uh, what your outline is like? And I sh- I sent him a screenshot of my Scrivener file, and it's like one line per chapter. There's like one little string of sometimes not with just the character's name and like a couple things, a couple wow. other words yep. for each chapter. And he's like, that's not very. Uh, that's a little different than what I do. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, funny because he apparently he goes down to the he goes down into mud, very granular detail before he dictates, and I just yeah. can't do it. I just could never stay to an outline. It slows me down so much. But th- my dictation drafts are the sloppiest thing anyone has ever seen, probably. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah, mine is not like very precise, or you know, it doesn't look very nice. It's more of a list of okay, this happens, then this, and then as I think of details, I kind of slot them in, mm. kind of more or less where they go. Um, no, that makes sense. I, it's I mean, messy, but I'll, yeah. let me just say that. <laughs> so, do you, do you do you outline uh, by paper, or do you do it to some digital means? I'm just curious now. Um, I do it in a digital file because what happens is whenever I think of things or what need to add stuff in, I either go in and just like type it in or cut and paste it in. So if I were writing it down, no, 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 that, that would too many changes too too much, no way to keep it all straight. The harder, the hard thing is, you know, I get ideas a lot and I'm, it just never fails. I'm laying in bed and I'm like ready to go to sleep. And that's when you relax enough to become creative. And so now that we have iPhones and stuff, I just jot myself a little note and email it to myself. And so I usually end up pulling those out of my email and then cutting and pasting them into my, you know, somewhere, wherever they kind of go in the app. <laughs> yeah, nice. That's a, that's, a, that's great. I actually was doing uh, just texting myself because you can text your own number. You can? Yeah, you can, and then it oh, just oh, now you and, tell and me. Then you, yeah, and you <laughs> end up with a double, and you end up with just two messages because you know it has your sent message, and then you the next then the message is an identical version of it that appears under it. Wow. Yeah, kind of a useful ability. I learned about that on uh, I think the Everyday Novelist podcast. Jay Daniel Sawyer. Does. I did yeah. not know that. I need to attempt that. Yeah, it's 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 kind of fun actually because then you're just like oh, I was Texas, and then that would clean up my uh, my inbox. Considerably, <laughs> a little harder to copy and paste it though if it's not on your computer. Oh well, yeah, okay. Uh, no, I'm not doing that then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, it's it's good for different things. Yeah, but anyway, uh, yeah. So we, we, as far as your as your uh, books go, it sounds like everything's going really well. You got the you know the whole TV show production. That's that's incredible. Thank you. That's very exciting. Super fun. Our our showrunner is amazing. Uh, brilliant guy wrote for the, um, the fringe for fringe and the oh, strain, fringe, nice. the strain as well, which is uh, a show I really love. Um, kind of scary. Show. Got, a good, got a good match there. Seriously. I think so. I'm, you know, <laughs> that, and I mean, you yeah. can, and you can tell too, because like his questions when he emails questions are so thoughtful and I love following kind of his mental process and seeing what's going on. And, I actually have in my inbox right now the first kind of treatment that he's put together mm. as they prepare to go pitch to networks. And um, so, so exciting. So, uh, 
yeah, super fun. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so but to, to, let's let's pull back a little from the TV now because the show is more okay. about about reading and books and stuff. What have you been reading lately? Um, okay, so I just actually finished um, an. Well, at the time, it wasn't out yet. I finished uh, reading for endorsement um, a book by a friend of mine named Stephen James, and it's called Synapse, and it's about AI, um, artificial intelligence. And it, it it's an interesting story because it brings up a lot of questions like, um, you know, the, the ethics around AI individuals, if we can call them mm. individuals, you know. Um, and, you know, even though they're artificial beings do they have souls and you know what about you know when they ponder these existential questions and stuff so it was really interesting i've actually run into quite a few stories about about ai recently including uh crucible uh which is james rollins mm. uh, so that was really interesting uh next up for me is the network by lc shaw that's coming out i think in december and uh, my friend J.D. Barker just had a book called The Sixth Wicked Child. And so that's um, he's got he's like a heck of a writer. J.D. is and he's, <laughs> and he's writing with Patterson, too, in addition to doing his own stuff. So, um, yeah, the name's familiar. Yeah. Brilliant guy. Yep. So all of these people are brilliant. Oh, also, my um, my editor friend, the one I mentioned earlier earlier the one that was like okay you're, we're, i'm not gonna let you you know make these same mistakes that you just did <laughs> yeah. um he has a new one out uh ya and it's called beautiful sky beautiful sky and his name is um steve per steven perolini but um beautiful sky beautiful sky so that is uh ya kind of coming of age fraught with many many issues that are confronting a lot of um young people today so wonderful. That's a lot of good recommendations. Uh, yeah. Yeah not, yeah. All, not all of them currently available, but yeah, that's great. It's, it's, yeah. Uh, it's some stuff people can look the forward to. Synapse by Stephen James is available. So that's the awesome. AI one. Yeah. Beautiful sky, beautiful sky is available. And JD Barker's the sixth wicked child is available. So yeah, those are out right now. Yep. So go find those books, people go find those <laughs> books. Yes. Yeah. And sure. uh, I don't have a big update on the, in this regard for my reading lately because this is the second show recorded this week. So, uh -oh. yeah, I'm still – no, no, it's okay. I'm just – <laughs> it's it makes me a little crazy, but it's it's going to work out. Um, so uh, so you can refer to my what I said last episode if you need to. That was the episode with Craig DeLewey. And that's uh, – yeah, Wonder Boys was my current um, mm. reading and still is because, yeah <laughs> – that's what happens you know, when you record somebody. I'm not a very fast reader myself, so I, I, and I tend to listen to a lot of books on uh, mm. audio. So, oh yeah, that's that's um, getting more and more common these days. People listening to audiobooks. It's a, it's a huge boom. The people yeah. Are talking. yeah, yeah. Well, and the the people who do the reading are just so good. Yeah. And if you're like me and you drive quite a lot, then it, it's sometimes an easier way to to get your reading done. That makes sense. I yeah. I'd probably be a big bigger audiobook fan if I wasn't so addicted to podcasts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I listen to so much nonfiction, basically audiobook style stuff that it's yeah, it, yeah. It's, it fills up all my time. But anyway, uh, thanks for being on the show, Tosca. It's been a lot of hey, fun. yeah. Thanks for having me back. It's great to chat with you again and. Oh my gosh, you've written way more books than me. So oh, I, they're not very good, though. I honestly, oh, well, I honestly the majority of them aren't very good. <laughs> let me put it that way. Well, I, I wouldn't say the new ones aren't. Are, 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 let me let me rephrase that. The early ones were no good. I wrote oh. those when I, very quickly when I was a teenager, and they don't really hold up. Luckily, no, they're not out in the world, so you can't really you can't find the bad ones, folks. <laughs> don't worry. All the books that are out there are great. You'll enjoy them. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, you got to write. You got to write, write some some books to learn how to do it. You got to write novels to learn absolutely. how to write novels. Absolutely. And I wrote some absolute stinkers to start with. <laughs> it was terrible. But there you go. It's it's a natural thing that I think most writers go through that. I wouldn't say everyone because everyone's different. But a, a large number of writers have written their share of bad. Uh, well, not oh, yeah. bad. But I, totally I've got I've got a skeleton in my basement that, <laughs> and people are like, "Oh, why don't you dig it out?" And put, no, 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 it's nope, not publishable. Nope, 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 nope. <laughs> that thing's not gonna see the light of day. So no, no, ever, ever, ever. Yes, oh, never. And that's where they shall remain, buried yep. in the basement. That's right. Uh, yeah. So yeah, th thanks again for being on the show. 
and tell people where they can find you. I'm sure that people, most of them are aware, but remind everyone. Yeah, you can find me on my website, which is toscalee.com. It's T-O-S-C-A-L-E-E.com. I'm also on social media, usually as Tosca Lee, um, or on Facebook, author Tosca Lee. So um, I'm pretty much in all those places. So you can find me really fast with a Google search. So, <laughs> Well, awesome. Thank you once more. And as for this podcast, you can find more episodes at mentalsellerpublications.com. You can find the feed at Libsyn. I forget. I always forget the actual name for the title for the feed. But if you fi- search for a live after reading on Libsyn, you'll find it. Also, uh, you can find my books out there in the world. So don't forget Demon Scroll. That's a big epic fantasy that's out right now. The next one, Shadow Prince, is up. That's in the same series. That's up for pre-order. So check that out. And, of course, then I've got the Pillar Universe series that's currently... Uh, seeing kind of a little bit of a renaissance. Ooh. So uh, check that out. That's Stormfleet is the first book there. And you can get all that on Amazon.com. So thanks for listening, folks. And have a great evening. That tears it. <laughs>